thinking, and then to card playing, and then I got shot, so I'm dying today. I once had a mother, a gray-haired old mother, she rocked me to sleep and she sung me this song. And there was another more dear than a mother. She never will know where her cowboy has gone. Go gather around me a bunch of young cowboys and tell them a tale of a cowboy's sad fate. And warn them all gently to quit their wild roving, to quit their wild roving before it's too I'm just a poor cowboy, I know I've done wrong. Then beat your drum slowly and play your fife lowly. Get six of them gamblers to carry me along. And in the grave throw me and roll some rocks o'er me. I'm just a poor cowboy. I know I've done wrong. As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out into old Laredo town, I spied a poor cowboy all wrapped in white linen, all wrapped in white linen, for they had gunned him down. Oh, I see by your outfit you are a cowpuncher. This poor boy said from his lips of flame red. They done gunned me down, boys, and run off and left me. Here in the back street just like I was dead. Well, I see by your outfit you are a cow puncher. This poor boy says as I boldly step by. Come sit down beside me, my story I'll tell you. Cause I'm a poor cowboy. And I'm going to die. Well, I was born in southeast Texas, where the Johnson weed and the lilac does bloom. I And I've trailed from Canada down to no, Mexico. No. Okay, it's my attempt to sweeten the bitter pillar, the bitter pillar messages. And essentially, you've got the major message, which is, let me remind you, four days, Friday, for the Frankenstein show, and let me remind you once more because I'm sure some of you won't be here on Wednesday, that uh, it will be at the Performing Arts Theatre. Not here. Not here, but the Performing Arts Theatre on Friday and...
not on Wednesday. And, uh, well, the rest is just geniality. I feel obliged to provide a lecture for students here on Wednesday. Uh, I feel obliged for many different reasons. Uh, I won't go into all of them. I still have myself peculiar and complicated doubts about how one influences the situation in South Africa. And I just don't know. I mean, it is very, very difficult to see what the outcome might well be. Uh, the question is, are you performing, if you go to the strike, if you strike, which again I think is a word that you have to think about very carefully, um, boycott seems to me to be much more accurate than strike. Uh, strike is a much more forceful word, of course. But are you acting on the administration of this country? Are you acting on the administration of uh, South Africa? Are you, I mean, is your primary purpose to show sympathy to uh, the oppressed and extremely foully treated black and colored people and mixed people in South Africa? Because different things you may achieve. And I, I just have this still continuing fear of the explosiveness of that situation. I think it's very, very explosive indeed. So it's difficult to know what to do. And perhaps I'm just simply slightly cowardly in uh, deciding to teach a class. I can't make out whether that's my motive or whether it is that I'm simply a pedant and that I know that there's an enormous amount of information to be got through and uh, I feel that I'm losing classes. Uh, and uh, it just sells my conscience as a teacher to carry on teaching. Uh, maybe it's just that I'm fond of the sound of my own voice and uh, I haven't been asked to speak out there so I'll continue to speak in here. Maybe it's, maybe it's something different and I like to think it was something different but I can't be sure. Maybe it's that I think that some of you will learn effectively something because you are capable of putting things together and that it may be more important, maybe just as important, to uh, discuss probably I should think David by next Wednesday with any luck, but we're moving closer to the French Revolution. It may be more important for some of you to discuss that than to add your bodies to the strike. Uh, I haven't had a chance to consult with my colleagues and I don't really know what my colleagues think. And just as I imagine most of, most of the students have, have been arguing very, very, very strongly with each other about this, haven't they? Is there anybody in this room who hasn't said a word about apartheid in the last week? <laughs> well, not many, and they're shy if they exist. Unfortunately, I have very little chance to consult with my colleagues and it's always wise to try to get some wisdom from other people before you rush off in your own direction. Well, whatever my motives, and they are mixed, please don't attribute malice to me. It's not, I'm not malicious, I may just simply be a bit timid. But mainly, I think, I find it difficult to make up my mind on this one. There are, there are others. The thing that perhaps concerns me as much as anything is so far as I've gathered it, is the serious and unpleasant way in which authorities in various places have reacted to uh, protest. And the most dangerous thing that can happen is that your protest simply gets suppressed. My view is that the most, the most satisfactory thing that could happen is that the South African government makes it possible for many more people to go and see what actually is going on in South Africa. I don't think what is going on is at all pretty, but the very fact that more people out of South Africa are seeing what is going on is probably, I think, the safest, if not the quickest pressure for some kind of change.
We need to know. And I suppose one of the things that those of you who do go on boycott or strike or whatever you call it may feel reasonably assured is that you may be muddying, you may be muddying the waters in some respects, but you are, I think, helping to draw attention to the need to know what is going on and to think about it. And that's the first step. It, it, I just say again to you that it will take a long time. It will take a long time because the situation has been going on for a very long time. And I imagine by now most of you have heard of the Sharpsville massacre. Yes? Is there anybody in the room who doesn't know what that? Well, I think it's probably about 1961. But uh, there was a protest amongst blacks in a shanty town and not for the first time and not for last time, whether the police lost their heads or were deliberately asked to fire on them, uh, a very substantial number of people were killed just one morning, just like that. And there were some substantial protests then. What is so disheartening is that 23, 24 years later, plus ça change, plus c'est les mêmes choses, that uh, that society has not made any substantial improvement so far as one can see, the chances are that in many ways it has regressed. And that's, I mean, that is so depressing. All right, I, I think that's as much as I should say, isn't it? Mm? And it may be a little bit more than I, I meant to say, but I can't, I can't sort out your consciences for you and uh, I, I'm sorry, but I don't think you can sort out my conscience for me. <laughs> but it is a matter of conscience and a matter for deep brooding. And it is at least hopeful that your political education is going on now, isn't it? Even if it's a rather rough and pretty wobbly political education. All right, I'm now going to sing for you. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't heard it yet, and could we have, could we have the, the lights off and the screen down, because uh, uh, my singing is timed for a particular slide. And I'm going to sing for you, possibly, a couple of songs from a very famous opera called The Beggar's Opera. Man may escape from rope or gun, nay, some have outlived the doctor's pill. Who takes a woman must be undone. That basilisk is sure to kill. The oh dear, I've pitched it too high. No. <laughs> the fly, the sipstreacle is down in the sweet. So he that takes woman, 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 he that tastes woman, ruin meats. When, when the heart of a man is depressed with care, the mist is dispelled. When a woman appears like the notes of a fiddle, she sweetly, sweetly raises his spirits and charms his ears. Roses and lilies her cheeks disclose, but her ripe lips are more sweet than those. Press her, caress her with blisses, her kisses. Dissolve us in pleasure and soft repose. <laughs> Roses and lilies her cheeks disclose, but her ripe lips are more sweet than those. Press her, caress her with blisses, her kisses. Dissolve us in pleasure and soft repose. <laughs> what you should all be looking like. <laughs> Those ballads which I sang you from are uh, the Beggar's Opera, which was put on in 1731 or so, 
and was an enormous, indeed a colossal success. And uh, interestingly enough, and the reason why I sang it was because apparently we don't have it on tapes in the library. We do not even have on tapes something which is very much better known, I suppose, in the 20th century, which is Die Groschen, uh, die, die, die Frei Groschen Opera, the opera which Bertolt Brecht made on the basis of the beggar's opera to satirize conditions in Germany in the 1920s. And the beggar's opera was a satirical opera. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why I suppose it ran so well. It was a tremendous political menace to uh, the uh, administration of Sir Robert Walpole. The tunes were popular tunes. Uh, I don't suppose from my singing you realize that they were tunes. But uh, uh, they, were, they were, you know, ordinary tunes which people would sing in the streets and so on and so forth. And the opera itself really was an opera satirizing politics and high life by setting high life below stairs. And the hero was, in fact, a highwayman called Captain McHeath. And he sings a famous song, uh, How happy could I, I be with either, twerd other dear charmer away? Because there are two girls who are after him, Polly Peachum and Lucy Lockett. Polly Peachum is, of course, just a trowel, just a drab, just a prostitute. Uh, Lucy, Lucy Lockett is the daughter of the turnkey, that's to say the prison jailer. And appearing in the opera is, of course, some version of Jonathan Wilde the Great. Jonathan Wilde the Great was a great thief taker who was, of course, a corrupt precinct captain. And so, with the beggar's opera, you see the other side of the 18th century from the side which is so exquisitely and wonderfully exhibited for us by uh, the charming parks and glistening glades of Antoine Watteau and his disciples Boucher and Fragadar. And that side, the drab, the underside, the underbelly of the 18th century, is exhibited much more, of course, in English art than it is in French art, because London is a much more of a hurly-burly town, and because the English middle class, so-called, but the English uh, rentiers, entrepreneurs, wealthy tradesmen, less wealthy tradesmen, innkeepers, bakers, candlestick makers were themselves getting into the act of some form of patronage. And the other thing I suppose one would have to say is that while there are undoubtedly many attempts at uh, 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 various forms of suppression of opinion in England, they really were stymied by some uh, political laws which were passed in the 1690s, uh, which really limited censorship in England, so that you could have a really critical press. In France, let us forget that the encyclopedia had a great deal of trouble in the middle of the 18th century. Voltaire could not publish his uh, writings in France. Uh, Helvetius couldn't publish in France. Jean-Jacques Rousseau had to publish in Amsterdam. But it's very interesting that, for instance, I own a copy of a book by Helvetius which was published in London. Voltaire's works were published in London. They're published in French in London. The great presses of Amsterdam and London poured out, you see, because in France there was an effective censorship. And while you could, while you could print books abroad, it was much more difficult to evade the censorship in terms of pictorial art. So it is not surprising that if we want to look at subversive or critical art, we're more likely to find it in England than we are in France. But before we go on and do that, and this is a wonderful Hogarth image, and as you can see, this is just funny. This is not subversive. I mean, a little boy peeing is never very subversive. I mean, because, you know, you, a little boys pee just anywhere. Uh, let's have a look at the next. Before I do that, I just wanted to, I just wanted to show you that, that, that a little bit more of the porcelain world and to remind you of its oriental origins. And here, you see, is a piece of Meissen, and it's in what is called Brongdachin, white china. And one of the things you simply have to, um, you have to remember is the enormous expense of this. My brilliant assistant was telling me the other day something which I probably never knew, but I concealed the fact that I didn't know it from her very skillfully. And I said, oh, yes, that's very interesting, yes. Uh, and I think for a moment she thought I knew it. Uh, but she told me that some of the more expensive and complicated pieces of porcelain were fired from 12 to 14 times. Isn't that right? 12 to 14 times. So you can see they're extraordinary luxury goods. And part of it was in order to imitate 
uh, the Oriental. And that imitation of the Oriental, of course, gets into so many things. This is a wonderfully hybrid object, isn't it? Because the, the pot is Oriental, the pot is Chinese, and it's one of those pots glazed in one of these magnificent single colours. And then the doodars, hmm, I think you can only call them doodars, in Ormolu, are of course French. And they're French trying to be Oriental, and they're French in fact being Rococo. Let's go on, because uh, the taste for this Oriental stuff gets into Fragona, into, into uh, uh, Vauteau, gets into Boucher, and here is a Boucher uh, cartoon for a tapestry, you see? And you see wise Chinese people about to uh, light fireworks, which of course the Chinese invented perhaps, and playing with Joss, and wearing their characteristic uh, headdresses and whiskers and so on and so forth, painted as an amusement uh, in the middle of the 18th century to frisk up that taste. And here you see even more interesting, not French chinoiserie, but English chinoiserie. And if you want a good book on chinoiserie, there's an excellent book by, Henry, by Hugh Honor. It's just simply called Chinoiserie. And some of you may have taste bizarre enough uh, to explore chinoiserie. It's a wonderful and extraordinary thing. And here you see an English tapestry of the early 18th century. And once more, the characteristic hat, the characteristic, they suppose, clothes, and trees that are beginning to look very like pagodas. Uh, and you'll also notice that, in fact, the landscape jumps about as it does on a Chinese pot. And it doesn't doesn't obey any of the rules of perspective. And Rococo art tends to be contemptuous of perspective for the most part. And you see the scale doesn't change, and you have enormous flowers and listens, you have these extraordinary fans, and you have people fishing away and so on and so forth. Here's a detail. And you can see how large the flamingos are and how they, uh, how they enjoy it. And then you can see how it is applied in the whole room. And in the middle of the 18th century, many an English room, and many a French room, and many an Italian room uh, was decorated with this new and fascinating stuff, Chinese wallpaper. Now, Europeans had had wallpaper for the 18th century, but these Chinese wallpapers seem to be particularly attractive, and you can see that they really go in a rather odd way with the rest of the room, don't they? They seem to be lighter, more delicate, and more frisky. And uh, they were an invitation to frisky and light and delicate behavior. You also notice that the furniture is Chinese, and then these great big uh, goldfish bowers are Chinese, and here you have a wonderful black lacquer cabinet, and the lacquer probably was oriental. It might have been not oriental, it might have been mere Japaning. And Japaning, as distinct from lacquer, was painting the furniture black in imitation of lacquer. It was done, interesting enough, by many uh, a cultivated and upper-class lady. She would say to her friends, I'm sorry, I can't come to gamble this afternoon, I'm Japaning. Hmm? Uh, which meant that she was painting, uh, she was painting her cabinets black instead of the town red. Uh, except that some lacquer, of course, was red, not black. And here we see some green lacquer. And notice, you see, this characteristic little Chinese element here. The rest of, the, of this little stool is entirely European, but here's a little Chinese thing to show that you were wise and that you could be a citizen or a citizeness of the world, and you were involved in the latest taste. And what it tells you is something else which is very interesting, is a thing which I think does happen in the 18th century, in a way that it hasn't happened before. And some of you would be interested in that kind of thing, uh, and there are good books by a man called James Laver on taste and fashion in costume. But the speed at which fashions change begins to hot up in the 18th century. Now, when taste changes very slowly, it's not easy to think in terms of fashion. Fashion belongs to an epoch when taste is changing rather faster. And that has to do with a very different attitude towards merchandising. And merchandising of furniture began to be an important thing in the 18th century. We're going to look at another little scene. And this is a Chippendale chair. It is a Chippendale chair done here, to some extent, in the Chinese fashion. This kind of ribbing, which is slightly off-center, and all these ribs, which go, you see, a, 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 Western, a Western horizontal would run right across. A 
Western vertical would right, run right down. But this funny kind of slightly bizarre and illogical interlace is supposed to be oriental. Now, we know that this is a Chippendale chair perhaps because Mr. Chippendale ran a very large furniture business. But even more important, in 1754, he produced a thing called the Directory. And the Directory was actually, you see, the predecessor of Sears Roebuck. <laughs> it enabled you, so to speak, to begin to buy things out of catalogues, or at least get designs out of catalogues. And that became characteristic for furniture. And in 1773 or so, Josiah Wedgwood, whom you've all heard of, you know he's a great China man, the limping China man, he, he had a bad leg, uh, he produced his first catalogue. And the crowned heads of Europe said, oh, Mr. Wedgwood, I must have something from your catalogue. Now, what that really means, do you see, is that the way in which you're merchandising things is beginning to change. And it's very crucial in the case of Wedgwood. Uh, and the more you get this alliance of well, what, is, what are these catalogues? They are a primitive form of advertising, aren't they? And when you begin to realize that advertising can be done on paper and done rather effectively through catalogues and that kind of thing, you are going to change taste a very great deal. And you're going to create a world of fashion. What is the other absolute concomitant in order to, to have fashion? What is the thing that you have in order, in order to create a fashion? What? Money, yes, money, dears. Mm? You have to have money, and who has to have money? Fools, dears. Mm? What you need is people who easily parted from a rather large amount of money, and then you can have Vogue magazine. Mm? Well, you think about it. Mm? That's a basis. And so, in England, you have people with some spare cash, and you have one other thing, which is crucial. And that is you have to have the possibility of rushing through or trying to swindle your way through or slinking through or crawling through or sliding through or slithering through or becoming invisible and making your way through class barriers. Then it's worth, you know, being in fashion. You're never going to bother about being in fashion if people say, oh, well, you know, that silly little, that silly little dustman He's wearing diamonds this week. Hmm? Oh, that absurd uh, girl who serves in uh, uh, Macy's. She's wearing pearls this week. Hmm? I mean, you know, if you can't get through the barrier, you might just as well forget fashion. Hmm? Which is, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of you seem to have forgotten fashion. Because you know that uh, you're not going to get through the class barrier. Hmm? God, you sound gloomy. You feel gloomy the moment I say you're not going to get through the class barrier. Hmm? Anyhow, so fashion, and to Chinese fashion, is one of those fashionable things. And here you are, a really very fashionable bed, and this is a Chippendale, this is a Chinese Chippendale bed, a Chinese Chippendale pride crust table, and a Chinese Chippendale or similar lacquer commode, and wonderful Chinese wallpaper, but it looks as though it's in some kind of government building, isn't it? Hmm? doesn't look as though it's very well exhibited. This is all phony, and the floor doesn't quite go with it. But you can see there's this enormous fashion. And so you can, you can think of what well, the fashion gets into pagodas, and this is a pagoda which is actually built in Kew Gardens, about 1750-something. Let's have a look at the next. Uh, and here is Pilemon, one of the great designers in the Chinese manner. And here are a couple of his charming little drawings. Let's have a look at the next. Come on, we can't wait. Here we are, you see. And, in fact, the drapery is pleasingly disarrayed. You notice a little moustache and beard. You notice a strange headgear. And then you notice the general wispiness of everything. Uh, it's capacity to be very delicate and to fade away and be like puff pastry. Well, my dears, have you ever seen anything much more extraordinary and fashionable? Hmm? I mean, you know, only if you're in the grip of a mad, fashionable mania are you going to buy something like that. I mean... It doesn't appeal to your aesthetic sense. It just is something wonderful to have on the mantelpiece and say to your friends, look what I've got. Mm? I got it at the flea market. Could you believe it? Mm? <laughs> and then occasionally say, well, you know, it's a little bit like my aunt, my aunt Henry. I mean, my uncle Wilhelmine. Uh, little teapot. And you see, 
such pleasure in such light of things. Well, of course, they rapidly become not just simply articles to look at, but articles to look at and use. And you would have a little bit of butter or a sweet meat in this dish. Uh, and you would hand it round. And here you see something else which is very typically rococo, the uh, crustaceans, the, the shells, the uh, lobsters, the crabs. And uh, coquillage, coquillage, shell, shell fishery, is very characteristic of rococo, and it's very characteristic of European porcelain. And notice at a certain stage, it ceases to be oriental at all. They've made a kind of mirage of, uh, uh, of, of the Chinese. Uh, and then they happily pursue that mirage wherever it'll go. I mean, look at these wonderful handles, you know, just champing at the bit. Uh, and uh, then look at the swirling quality of all this and the way this dragon, of course, the whole notion of a dragon, a, a, fresh, a fresh group of dragons was so charming for the 18th century because they were paper dragons. Uh, they weren't even paper tigers. They were paper dragon kind of thing. And then back, you see, totally acclimatized to the European tradition in various kinds of ways. Let's have a look at the next. Uh, a lovely girl. And you see how close it is to uh, the world of painting and the world of light-hearted frolic. There we are, there's that familiar land, Différent by Votto, to remind you. But articles of use. I told you a teeny bit about tea and coffee. Well, here is a Meissen teapot, somewhat rich and somewhat mysterious, because the gilding is not very Chinese, it's just simply expensive. But the decoration is Chinese. It is possibly a teapot, possibly a, co a chocolate pot. And here is a very fine a Meissen also coffee pot. And you can see how expensive. Look, in fact, this is a very small painting. And many of the best artists of the 18th century spent some time painting in the porcelain factories. And indeed, uh, a great English sculptor called Flaxman, a French sculptor called Falconet, both designed figurines. Kengler and Bustelli were major sculptors. Uh, in fact, George Stubbs, the great English animal painter, worked in the closest connection with uh, Josiah Wedgwood. And here, so as to get to Hogarth at long last, we see, in fact, some china being put to use. This is the second scene in the Harlot's Progress, and there is, I mean, about a couple of thousand pounds worth of china going for a Burton, uh, being smashed. Uh, I draw your attention to the little blackamoor here. He would be called a blackamoor in the 18th century, who, of course, was a page for this high-class uh, high and extremely expensive prostitute bringing in the kettle. And next, I show you a not dissimilar figure in porcelain, uh, a grotesque, a punch, uh, and he, quite characteristic of a great deal of 18th century decor was to have uh, Blackamoors uh, as uh, torsiers. There are some splendid torsiers in uh, Car Resonico in Venice, where two extremely handsome, grinning black people hold up great flambeau. Uh, and I show you this one, which is another Hogarthian scene, because you can see these figures being collected by the fashionable countess on the mantelpiece. And she spent an enormous quantity of money to have uh, bonzes and laughing Buddhas uh, and uh, bits of Bow and Chelsea, which were the names of the English factories, that are on her mantelpiece. Here we see a little bit more chinoiserie on a nice little soup cup or something, or a chocolate cup. And here are rather more primitive, some more Chinese people on a meat dish. So that you can see it gets all applied. And then you see the absolute, I mean, the pleasure which people took in these small uh, arts in the 18th century. These delightful little baskets. This was probably a chestnut basket uh, or a strawberry basket in porcelain. And, I mean, you can imagine just how expensive it was to do all this coiled work in clay. I mean, think how much cheaper it is to have polythene, how much cheaper and how much nastier. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, you know, duchesses, countesses would do their own washing up when they had uh, articles like this uh, because they didn't want them smashed. And then these wonderful playful things, which have a Chinese origin, gourds and so on, which is in the form of vegetable dishes. Some people find them beautiful, some people find them ugly, some people find them vulgar, some people find them ostentatious. They are the light-hearted taste of the 18th century. And there's another figure, and let me remind you how close it is to Votto in uh, the famous uh, 
signboard of Gerson, the, that of which is the detail. And of course, in fact, the whole thing could become very much like a major piece of sculpture because you could have two or three figures, and here are, here are a pair of lovers, the lady is sewing, the young man is kissing his hand to her, and he's about uh, to push the table aside and land on her lap. Uh, and the dog will probably bite him. And you see how close that is, uh, how close that is to a little scene of spring painted by Francois Boucher. And the paintings are as light-hearted as the porcelain, and the porcelain is the same color as the painting. They go wonderfully together. Here's another, here's another little scene, uh, probably a Venus, but it's a dolphin, so it might be Thetis and some little angelic person. And I wanted to put that next to a, a painting of slightly greater seriousness, but not much greater seriousness. This is a painting by J.H. Fragonard, the delicious Frago, and it's called The Country Schoolmistress. But is she really a country schoolmistress, or is she just uh, any old mum with uh, some recalcitrant children? But I want you to look at the charm of this little puto. You notice the little boy is, is twirling his toes in on themselves. He's obviously done something naughty, and he's about to be smacked. Mm? And he's in a fit state to receive a gentle smack, perhaps. Uh, and all the other children are deeply amused because he's being scolded. And you see, he is absolutely charming, and he's quite unlike any child you and I have ever met. Uh, <laughs> they're just as naughty, but not quite so fetching. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can see the connection which glassed through the whole of the 18th century. And I've talked to you about swings. Well, here's Frago, Fragonard's most famous swing picture. And you can see that the whole object of the painting is to tell you what a lovely time this young man is having, because <laughs> he, has, he has a view of some of the most intricate underwear in the world. Uh, but I want you also to think about it. Uh, these are meant to be husband and friend. And it's not quite clear which is husband and which is friend. Uh, and then you see, in fact, the whole thing exists in a world of make-believe, and the whole of nature sympathizes with this delicate frolic. If her underwear frosts up like mad, so do the trees. And it's a kind of absolutely frivolous orgasm. Uh, well, I think that's... If you can have such a thing, well, at your age, I suppose you can't, but uh, anyhow... <laughs> And here you see the same, the same kind of world is going on here, but notice the extraordinary skill of the painter and how this kiss pulls her right out of the middle of the painting and how you have that sense that she's being tugged by this young man because her little fichu, her little stole is right over here. And next door they're playing cards and it's called the stolen kiss and she's obviously come in to get this because she's a little bit cold, and there he is, just in time. He leaps out from the door, rushes forward, and she doesn't know what to think. <laughs> but she knows what to feel. Hmm? She knows what to feel. Her mind is still saying, I've got to get back to the gambling. But the rest of her is saying, I say, well, why not? <laughs> and, uh, and this is, of course, a more violent scene, uh, and a less agreeable one. But part of an enormous body of work done in the 18th century. If you think that pornography is an entirely new event, that's obviously not true. Uh, if you think that erotic art is an entirely new event, that's obviously not true. Pornography has a very long history. Erotic art has a very long history. And this is just a fairly mildly uh, erotic subject, though it has, I think, certain brutality uh, in the forms, and she clearly is not really very pleased with what's going on. Hmm? All right, so we can see this tradition uh, going all the way from the elegances uh, of Watto to the elegances of Fragonard, but with an undercurrent of uh, a, a possible brutalization and so on. And uh, I would recommend you to look more at uh, those French 18th century painters. I just don't have time, because Hogarth is such an enormously important phenomenon. He was born in the late 1690s and died in 1764, so he has a, a lifespan of nearly 70 years. And he's an extremely prolific artist, and he's enormously important for a very simple reason. His work is made for reproduction. He himself makes 
reproductive work. He actually engraves his own paintings. Indeed, he makes some engravings which don't have any paintings before them and are made directly from drawings. Through the medium of engraving, he becomes very, very widely known indeed throughout Europe. Now, it is perfectly true that Botto does some engravings and the Boucher starts off by engraving Botto and that there are many engravings made after Fragonard. But there isn't the same deliberate merchandising that there is with Hogarth. And Hogarth should be familiar to you for one very interesting thing, if for nothing else. He is a person who gets the first really successful copyright act onto the statute books. In 1735, he has a tremendous success. I think it's 1735. He has tremendous success with a group of prints, and then he finds that they're being pirated. But what does pirating mean? It means simply that other people are re-engraving and stealing them. You know, it's a sort of primitive form of what all professors do with zero, zerography. They take no notice of the Copyright Act. And one of these days, there's going to be a huge row. And Hogarth gets through the British Parliament, shows you what a skillful businessman he is. He gets through an act which protects, for a long period of time, the property in visual engravings. Now, it is not a property in the written word. It's a property in the visual word. And it tells you that Hogarth is, of course, very close to words. And well, next to Fragonard, we can see a, a primitive form of Hogarth's other really major invention besides the copyright. The, what he invents, or at least brings to a kind of high pitch, is the visual novel. And now, this is a very short visual novel. You would call it a novella. And uh, this is the first scene. And I mean, I, I'm half, half inclined to ask you to write down what happens in the second scene, because I don't think you'll have, you've been to the flicks before. You've seen television. Hmm? Hogarth, you could say, is the originator of uh, middle-class soap opera with a moral. Hmm? He produces, well, what is the next scene going to be? Here, for instance, is the rocket going up. Hmm? Now, you know exactly what a rocket is a symbol of. And what do you suppose that, what will happen to that picture in the second scene? Hmm? Do you think he'll be quite so full of the joys of spring in scene two? What do you think is going to happen to the chamber pot? <laughs> How is the dog going to be? What about the mirror? What about the lassie? Well, here we are, scene two. Hmm? There you are, dog fast asleep. He's obviously a voyeur and fully satisfied. Mm -hmm. The rocket has come down, fizzled out, and Cupid is not very pleased. The mirror is broken, and he looks as though he's lost some of his fire. <laughs> and the, the, this series is simply called Before and After. <laughs> and it is the simplest, and one is told, one of the oldest stories, and Hogarth makes it into a highly saleable pair of prints. And then he goes on from that to really develop the novel. And it's not surprising the way that it happens in England, because England is full of novel readers. Nor is it surprising that it happens to Hogarth. Because Hogarth, my dears, was the son of a nonconformist minister who was popped into prison for debt. Really, you see, his life is not unlike the life of young Dickens. You remember Dickens' father was put into a debtor's prison. Well, Hogarth's father was put into a debtor's prison. Hogarth immediately becomes deeply, 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 deeply interested in social reform. And Hogarth is an enormously important artist because he belongs to that movement in the 18th century which is known as the humanitarian movement, which eventually abolishes the slave trade, and which eventually abolishes slavery in the West Indies, and which then, of course, tries to abolish slavery in Africa and in the United States of America, and succeeds to some extent, in some of those places. The humanitarian movement, which is also deeply concerned with reforming prisons, which in the 18th century are amongst the most ugly and appalling things you can possibly imagine. And Hogarth gets this partly because, why does he do this partly? Because he, he comes, you see, from a family of teachers. 
He is tremendously concerned with preaching and teaching and adorning a tale with a moral. And he also, you see, has been deeply concerned with advertisement and deeply concerned with uh, engraving. He actually starts off as an artist in a very interesting place as an apprentice to somebody who does engraving upon silver. And I'm going to show you, this is one of his first works, 1720, he's a young man, and it is his trade card. So you know with Hogarth he's a tradesman. Well, here we have a typical, oh, 1730, 1740, silver, as distinct from porcelain, teapot. And somebody had to engrave the little coats of arms on it. Many, many pieces of silver engraved in a much more lavish fashion. There are one or two pieces which they believe were actually engraved by Hogarth. But that's how he starts. He does not get a formal training in an academy, nor does he get a formal training in an ordinary artist's studio. What he does eventually do is to marry the daughter of a very illustrious English painter. But he teaches himself, and it is quite characteristic that the sons and daughters of professors have to teach themselves, because professors are so bored with teaching everybody else that they can't be bothered to teach their own children. Mm, you bet. And so, Hogarth starts off like this, you see, and has to teach himself to paint. And this is one of his first paintings. He's already in his late twenties, and he doesn't know very much about oil painting. And what, interestingly enough, is the first thing that he paints. It is a street sign. And it's a sign for somebody who sells paving stones, a pavia sign. And there, you see, are people preparing a piece of ground outside an important mansion, and uh, they are going, in fact, with their picks. They're then going to make a place, and then this is going to be, instead of a dirty street full of pigs, it's going to become an elegant front court to a grand building. And Hogarth begins to tell a story, and you have figures of a certain scale arranged across the front, as in a theatre, and behind you have something very like theatre scenery. And it is fascinating that Hogarth starts off, you see, in this way, directly with trade. Then, in the 1720s, he becomes a book illustrator, and he illustrates a famous satirical poem called Hudibras. Uh, Hudibras himself is another non-conformist, a, a Puritan, an extreme Puritan, of the most funny qualities. And then, fascinating enough, one of the first sort of real steady paintings of uh, Hogarth we have, and notice that, you see, Watteau had ended his life making a sign, uh, a signboard for a painter. Hogarth starts his life with sign painting, and it is not at all surprising that we find one of his first really independent paintings is a painting to literature. And the close connection between literature and painting in England is something which you must remark upon. And when I say he invents the visual novel, he's doing it exactly the time that other Englishmen are inventing the novel that you and I still read. You have all, I suspect, flirted with the pages of Moll Flanders by Daniel Defoe. If you haven't done that, you've read Robinson Crusoe. Or if you haven't done that, you've been forced to take some class in high school where you've read The Voyages of Gulliver. Well, notice, Gulliver is 1726. Moral Flanders is about 1720. Robinson Crusoe is a teeny bit earlier, I think. Hogarth is a young man. Hogarth is immortalized by Dean Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, in a, a couplet which simply says, Hail to thee, ingenious Hogarth, thou a very clever Rogarth. <laughs> Not a very good rhyme, but uh, and one of Hogarth's greatest friends was the wonderful novelist Henry Fielding, uh, who wrote that splendid film, Tom Jones. Mm? And here is Hogarth in the 1720s, and I wonder whether any of you, by cudgeling your brains a bit instead of sitting supine, could tell me the subject matter of uh, this particular painting. I think if you concentrate on this figure, you might possibly get there. If you also thought about this figure, you might possibly get there. Mm? What? And if you... What? Somebody was brilliant. Wind, raging rocks and stormy skies. 
The Tempest, yes, Shakespeare's Tempest. And you see, this is the monster Caliban. The noble savage Caliban, and here's Miranda, and here's Ferdinand, and here's Prospero. So that, you see, he's painting an illustration to Shakespeare. And you notice, in fact, that already certain qualities in Hogarth stand out. It's 1726. Do you think that this is a very handsome young man? What would you do if a young man came up to you like this? I mean, you would think, my God, he's a sort of second cousin to a, a goat or something. <laughs> do you think this is, a very, this is a very convincingly beautiful young woman? And do you think her gesture is sort of Miranda? You know what Miranda says when she first sees, me, when she first sees Ferdinand. She says, oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it. Well, she looks as though she's saying, hmm, look at the little pretty bar lamb, hmm, but keep your distance. The one that's most convincing, of course, is Caliban, because Caliban is satiric. And Hogarth, from the start, has this wonderful capacity to do funny things, uh, to amuse, to caricature. He himself often rejected the word caricature. And so we come to the justification for my singing earlier on. Another play, hmm? more literature. This is Hogarth's very famous scene of the Beggar's Opera. And what he was doing, you see, was cashing in on this fashionable play. Uh, everybody was going to see it, so he does, and there are three or four versions of it. People say, well, I think I'd rather like Captain McKeith, and here is Captain McKeith, uh, the highwayman, and here's Lucy, uh, and there's old Mr. Mr. Lockett, uh, you see, and there's Polly Peachum, uh, and you can see the prison of Newgate in the background, and Hogarth is telling the story of the beggar's opera. And we get another and more charming little painting about the same time where he goes and, and portrays noble children acting in uh, the conquest of Mexico, I think it is, or the Indian Queen, uh, in a private house. And you notice how skillfully he organizes the double scene and how charming these dear little creatures are. And what he does in this is he immediately develops one genre which becomes then a very popular genre which is the, it's often called the conversation piece. When you call it conversation piece, it's really a sort of modified group portrait. You know, and there are group portraits where everybody stands like that, you know, with rugby balls between their knees, or, or you know, or, or those awful uh, baseball mitts on their hands, that kind of group photograph kind of thing. But this is a kind of, this is a development of it, whereby mummy and daddy and all the children, and look how naughty the children are here, Mm, they're, they're, they're going to trip over that drive, they're going to knock over those books. Hey, ho, away we go. And Hogarth dearly likes naughty children. Uh, and you see, you get a nice informal family portrait. And the conversation piece or family portrait uh, goes on a long way. Well, where does Hogarth get all his, his fizz from, all his, all his vitality? He is a Londoner. And nobody knew, knew London better than Hogarth, except possibly Dickens, a century later. And Dickens is deeply influenced by Hogarth. And everything, you remember that Dr. Johnson lived in London, and Dr. Johnson said, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. For London has everything to show that life has to offer. And so, early in the morning, you can go off to Covent Garden, St. Paul's Covent Garden, in a set by, called by Hogarth four times a day, and you can see the late night taverns, and you can see the last prostitute at work, uh, while the, the world begins to wake up on this cold winter morning, and this prim lady certainly is not going to look at what's going on here with the, his hand into her bosom. She's certainly not going to see that because she's off to prayers. Uh, and uh, indoors as well as outdoors. Hogarth knows the seedy interiors of Santa Cruz, you might well say. Hmm? Uh, is this Walnut, or is this Washington? Or, but it's a distressed poet, and he knows... He knows what it is, you see, to be poor. He knows the beggars. He knows the impecunious bohemians. He knows Richard Savage, the great friend of Samuel Johnson, who used, in order to keep warm in the winter, to spend his night sleeping in the ashes of the glass houses, i.e. the factories where they blew glass. And here's a poor poet and his wife, who is mending his breeches, and 
What is this lady? She is, in fact, the butter woman, and she's been selling butter, and here is her tally on which she's showing, in an old-fashioned way, exactly how much the poor, distressed poet owes, and he is thinking, my God, if I can manage to rhyme impecunious with... Uh, um, impecunious with a... Uh, um, uh, impecunious... Uh, if I can just get out that last rhyme and sell it, then I'll be able to pay for the butter and we'll be able to butter our bread. Okay, so you see the world in which Hogarth comes from. He's a world which stretches right down because here is, he rushes off to prison, to Newgate in the early 1730s, 1735 I think actually, to take a portrait of a famous murderess called Sarah Malcolm. Isn't that fascinating? See, he is a journalist amongst other things. And in those days, well, you couldn't, you couldn't sort of beam it uh, by satellite or anything like that. So you had to go to the scene and report it. And he reports it, and she's obviously semi-repentant, but not very repentant. Uh, and she's got about one more hour to live, and then she's going to be damned eternally. And Hogarth, of course, like every other 18th century painter, not only was a journalist, he was almost always a portraitist. You look at almost any 18th century painter, they're bound to do a portrait or two. And Hogarth can go from the extraordinary austere background of Sarah Malcolm about to be hanged to this portrait, full Baroque movement. Look at the swirling thing, almost worthy of Rubens in the richness of the rhythm of Captain Coram. Now, Captain Coram himself is an interesting character. He was an ex-sea captain. And as you can see, he has his quadrant and he has his ships uh, and he has his globe, and when he retired and came back to live in London, he was absolutely appalled at the state of the, the great metropolis. Everywhere there seemed to be discarded babies, foundlings, mothers who couldn't hack it, mothers who simply couldn't manage to look after their small children, and they were abandoned. And he was a man of warm and delicate heart, and so he started a foundling hospital for these poor orphans. And people, instead of abandoning their children, would leave them at the front door of the foundling hospital, and a hand would come out from inside the hospital and take the poor little blighter and take it inside. Of course, the immediate result was total disaster. Some thousands of babies were deposited in about two weeks or something, and many of them died. So they had to start another way. But the foundling hospital was started, and it became a fashionable charity. Interestingly enough, Hogarth not only paints the founder of the founding hospital, Coram, but he persuades the directors, of which he eventually becomes one, to have musical concerts which the, which the uh, dear little creatures sing, the orphans sing, and then exhibitions of paintings. And he persuades his colleagues to give paintings to this charity, and then it becomes a fashionable place for people to go and look at the paintings. Wonderful advertisement for Hogarth, for Gainsborough, for Wilson, and for many other artists. Wonderful for the poor foundlings, uh, and a clever business idea. So you see Hogarth deeply involved in all these business ideas. Now, you have to understand that in the 18th century, as in any other periods, some kind of painting is thought more highly of than other kind of painting. You know, and until very recently, portraiture was absolutely the bottom of the barrel in the 20th century. Nobody thought portraiture was any good at all. Um, cubist, uh, surrealist, dadaist, mm, minimal, abstract expressionism, those were the fashionable things. And in the 18th century, religious painting had a certain kind of kudos. So Hogarth has to try everything, and so he does a painting of Christ, the healer, at the Pool of Bethsaida for one of the London hospitals. But, you know, Christ looks like a pantomime king. He doesn't really look a very convincing saviour. Uh, Hogarth is much better at the halt, the lame and the blind. And those he does extremely well. And he cannot find purchasers. There he is, and you can see what a brilliant, clever fellow. So as he can't find purchasers for that kind of painting, can't find those kind of commissions, what does he do? he decides to become a moralist. And he says somewhere he'd sooner be remembered as a moralist than as a painter. And for many, he's remembered as a moralist rather than a painter. And in 1733, 1744, or 1734, or thereabouts, the precise date doesn't matter, he moves from that very simple two-scened story, before and after, to the first of his famous progresses, the Harlot's Progress. 
And here we are, scene one, the Harlot's Progress. And you read it just as you would a novel. Here she is, she comes up to London, here's her trunk with her initials on it, Molly Hackabout. And what happens straight away? She's brought a goose up hmm, from her father in the country to relatives, a typical thing to do, you see, to bring some nice... And the goose, of course, is a symbol of herself with her neck run. And, oh, misfortune, 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 how terrible, how terrible, how terrible. She comes to the inn yard, which is where the coaches and the wagons come, and whom should she meet absolutely immediately but this distinguished and sinister lady? Hmm? Who do you see? You see all the patches on her face? She probably has had the pox more than once. But she is a pr prosperous board. And Molly, little Molly, she has a hussif on her arm, that's to say, you, she can do all the same. In the meantime, the foolish, foolish, foolish parson isn't saying, stop, girl, think, repent, don't go near. Hmm? Uh, this sinister procuress, he can't even look after his own horse. And so the horse is knocking over a pile of uh, uh, buckets while he preaches to uh, ladies who are already uh, been through it all. In the meantime, hmm, of course, this is a wonderful sexual symbol, the bell with the clapper. And who is this? This is the famous Colonel Charters. And apparently Colonel Charters one of the most notorious whoremongers uh, of the middle of the 18th century. So you see, it is enormously topical, and there is poor Molly Hackabout, fresh from the country, and she doesn't stand a chance, does she? Hmm? Beware of going to New York, dears. <laughs> you know, you dear little Santa Crucians. Hmm? There are plenty of Colonel Charters in New York, and you see he's already got a gloat on, and uh, his servant is saying, well, I think I can probably arrange that. Okay, let's have a look at the next scene. Well, I say that Hogarth invented the, uh, the novel, in, uh, the, the visual novel. Of course there are preliminaries. And in fact, there is an interesting 17th century Venetian harlot's progress. But it has none of the rich detail, none of uh, uh, the coordination. Here's a scene from it, and here is the, 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 the young lady is dancing, and they're having a jolly time. But it, doesn't, it hasn't got the same kind of coordination. Now we're on to scene two, which is already familiar to you, and uh, she has become a kept mistress. And what is going on here? Well, is actually her keeper, her protector, is a young, wealthy Jew, uh, and he is being fooled, isn't he? Hmm? She is kicking up a great rumpus in order hmm, to do what? To distract him from she's been very foolish. She has her own lover in her bed when her protector comes home. She has a faithful servant and he sneaks out of the door while she, and they've obviously been to uh, a theatrical the carnival or something like that. In the meantime, notice the split second action. Mm? The teapot actually falling off the table. Uh, the young page coming in, astonished, or pretending at any rate to be astonished, and then the dog playing with the ribbons. The little lap dog crept off her, crept off her, uh, her lap as she kicks over the table and says, I don't give a fig, or perhaps something a little bit more fruity than that. Uh, and of course, it wasn't really very wise, was it? She'd have done better not to have had that supernumerary lover. And here's another scene you see from uh, a bedroom or indoor scene from the Venetian prototype, but it just doesn't compare. And here's some more, and this is a Bolognese artist of the 17th century engaged in visual satire, but none of it. Here's another one, this is, his name is uh, Minelli, I think. Uh, and of course the visual satire goes all the way back to Bruegel and beyond. But Hogarth gives it a kind of coordination and, as I said, he provides something which is uh, analogous to uh, a novel. And one of the things we simply have to recognize is that the 18th century became the great novel reading age. Of course, in particular amongst novel readers were servants. 
and there's a huge development of the servant class in the 18th century, and there's a huge development in the 18th century of the lending library, just as there's a huge development of the newspaper. And we have to see Hogarth in uh, the same terms, because, of course, you could buy the uh, Harlot's Progress. I think they cost about five shillings each, so that for about 30 shillings, you could have a wonderful set of posters to decorate your pub or your sitting room or your bedroom or wherever it was. Uh, they were neatly engraved by Hogarth himself and uh, they sold in wonderful quantities because there was this huge appetite for novel reading. That was Fragonar, this is Sir Joshua Reynolds' niece, deeply involved in Clarissa, a novel by Richardson. And you see, even little boys would read uh, and I mean, people would read in the most peculiar places. <laughs> hmm? This is Sir Brook Boothby, who's actually reading not a... Well, I think he's reading maybe La Nouvelle Héloise by Rousseau, which was a Rousseau novel out in Adele. So we know that people did a lot of reading. Even Molly Ackerbout probably read an occasional thing or two. Well, what has happened to Molly? She's lost her expensive protector. She's a bit down in the dumps. And you can tell that uh, she's having to sell her favours uh, on a much broader scale. Uh, one of the little items you will notice here is a birch, which means that she's into sadomasochism. And the, the witch's hat means probably that she was particularly popular with Welsh uh, customers. Mm? And uh, the food ain't so good, and uh, she's thinking about pawning this watch, or maybe she's actually become engaged in a little elementary pickpocketing. And clearly, you see the broken punch bowl. She's no longer genteely taking her cup of tea in the middle of the afternoon. She's having to regale rougher types with rum punch and arak. And uh, she's drinking a tisane to restore her ruined looks uh, and her mouldy stomach. In the meantime, who are these coming in? the magistrate and his assistants, and she's about to be pulled, hauled off to prison. And lo and behold, there she is, safely in prison, with, clearly, a jailer who is also an exponent of sadomasochism. Uh, and she's with some pretty grisly, grisly, pretty grisly people, isn't she? Hmm? She's still in her finery, but look at these other people, beating hemp. Hmm? Uh, and they're probably going to tear her eyes out when nobody's looking because she's too much of a fine lady uh, for the rest of them. And she's taking her punishment and she's beating her hemp. And you see there's uh, somebody in the stocks behind. And uh, it's a good rich, it's a good rich story. And here obviously is a transvestite person who's got muddled up with the prostitutes. And uh, he was probably a famous London figure. And now what's happening? Oh, how rapid the declension is. How soon poor Molly Hackabout slides down the slippery slope. As you know, in the 18th century, the specific cure for syphilis was mercury. Well, can you imagine sort of applying lots and lots of mercury to yourself? Mm, very jolly cure. And there it is. And of course, poor Molly, still with her faithful servant, with a small child now, who's trying to cook a little bit of toast, while the gruel boils over on the fire, with every kind of broken plate and ruined this and that and the other, and coal all over the floor, and snuff spilt. Meanwhile, some other servant is happily looking at all her properties, and is going to take them over. And who are these two dear gents? My dear, they represent the medical profession. You might well say, plus ça change, plus c'est les mêmes choses. Mm -hmm. The more it changes, the more it's the same. And they, of course, are disputing about the nature of the cure while she expires. And the uh, final scene of all, well, here's the, here's the Venetian. And you see, you see, I mean, what an what a absolute world of difference there is between uh, the prototype and Hogarth. Ah, uh, last scene of all, Every penny is being spent on an expensive funeral. 
and all her professional colleagues hmm, are gathered together and being extremely sentimental about it, looking into the casket. Her child is bravely furnished out with the funeral garments, and the clergyman is having a very, very jolly time. Uh, he somehow has his hand sort of on a little voyage of exploration while he spills his drink, and he looks thoroughly preoccupied while you notice she has a very soupy look on her face. <laughs> and uh, genuine grief here, but also genuine liquor there. Uh, and so you have been warned, dear. The wages of sin is death, and a pretty grisly funeral at top speed. Is it time to go? Is that what the creaking means? Is it time to go? No, it's, it isn't time to go. Somebody said five minutes. Okay, well, let's go on quickly. Mm, just a teeny bit more. Mm. Well, the, 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 the Harlot's progress was a great success. So, no doubt, the feminists got at Hogarth and said, how about a rake's progress? And anyhow, feminists or not, very shortly after, he did a rake's progress. Now, one of the interesting differences is that the Harlot's progress... If he did paintings, they haven't survived. The paintings for the Rake's Progress have survived, and it's very interesting to see some of the changes which take place between the painting and the engraving. The engraving can be much more explicit, and it's fascinating. While Hogarth's engraving sold extremely well, so that very shortly he no longer actually did the engraving himself, he employed uh, journeyman engravers to do the engraving, the paintings never sold well. There wasn't an appetite in the sort of class which could afford the paintings that ready to buy them. So that Hogarth did another very fascinating thing. He invented the pictorial raffle. What he did was to sell uh, engravings at a guinea a time, which were tickets. And then the lucky winner would get the set of the rake's progress. We'll have this wonderful scene where the rake suddenly inherits. And uh, you can see that he inherits from a miser. You just look at that cat. Only a, only a miser could leave a cat in quite that condition. And then everything has been hidden away. Great, great, great trunks of silver. Great, uh, you look in the fireplace and you find thousands and thousands of guineas. You look, you look, you, you, you take down a bit of moldy tapestry and more guineas disappear. The young rake, of course, what's he doing, swine? Hmm? Now he's coming to his money. The little girl he's ruined is being turned away hmm, by somebody who is saying, you don't want to have any more to do with that silly little girl. She's over. You're wealthy now. Get rid of that little trowel because you're going up. And who is this? This is a tailor who's run in at the sound of the news and is immediately measuring him for a much better pair of trousers. And you can see what a silly young man he is. Wealth is going to go to his head. Hmm. Long expected one and twenty, lingering year at length is flown. Wealth and money, health and plenty, great Fitzroy are now your own. Loosen from the miner's tether, free to mortgage or to sell. Light as wind, white as, light, wild as wind and light as feather, bid the sons of thrift farewell. Call the Betsy's, Kate's and Jenny's, all the names that banish care. Lavish of your grandsire's guineas, show the spirit of an heir. And that is the rake's progress. And in scene two, he shows the spirit of an heir. And there you are. You see, look how he wonderfully is dressed. And he's got all of these scum round him. He's got his little dancing master here. And he's got his jockey here. And then he's got his bully here. You know, the kind of, the kind of thug that, uh, 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 put, that protects you in Chicago or Los Angeles or Aptos. Uh, well, chums... Off to Aptos with you, and don't be too rakish, and don't be too harlotish.